a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a rock. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expanding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very Expanding reality. Welcome to Expanding Reality. I am your host, Brandon Thomas. On this episode, psychologist, sexual educator, and a pioneer in consciousness studies, Dr. Jenny Martin comes by, and she is fascinating. Now, first of all, her website, her podcast, Why Didn't I Know, as well as her book, Jesus' Secret Saying About Sacred Sexuality, are all going to be linked down in the show notes. She is amazing, and you guys will love this. So on this episode, we talk about the cultural distortion of sexuality, Jesus and Mary in the Bible as archetypes for the Matrix movies, as well as sacred sexuality, sexual empowerment, the re-envisioning of sex, which is highly important, and of course, psychedelic states of consciousness. So uh, before we get to this episode, let's talk about the resource links located down in the show notes. You've got Food Forest Abundance down there. Get your freedom from fear on, guys. It's empowering and it's amazing. Also, if you want to start your own podcast, could not recommend it more. Uh, I can help with a jump with the Libsyn link down in the show notes. That's two months for free. So it gives you a great head start on your new endeavor and good luck to you on it. Godspeed. I highly recommend anybody who wants to do it. Go ahead and just do it. It's the coolest thing I've ever done. So try it out. Also uh, located down there is going to be our Amazon affiliate link. If you are going to feed that beast at all, just run it through that link. It's the same damn thing. It shows up as a browser and it helps the show. Also down there is going to be Opus, the organization for paranormal understanding and support, a phenomenal resource. So definitely check that out. And lastly, we have expandingrealitypodcast.com. That's where links to all of the socials, all of our lives are replayed there. If you don't catch them the first time around, they're replayed for free on the website. Also, the Too Hot for YouTube so many cool things going on there all the collaborations any shows i've been a guest on or panel spots union of the unwanted all that kind of stuff all of it's linked absolutely for free over at the website if you do want to support the show there is an option to do that as well and highly grateful thank you so uh, let's get to this incredible conversation guys with dr jenny martin all right ladies and gentlemen out there listening world everywhere welcoming to the show we have dr jenny martin and i am so excited to get into this with you you and i've been riffing here a little bit before we got going and you are so cool and so interesting so i cannot wait for my audience to get to know you better so on that note do you mind just telling us a little bit about yourself oh sure well thanks i'm so happy to be here thank you so much brandon i love what you're doing it's so important to have these types of discussions too. It's really very cool. And about myself, well, I'm on the same journey of expanding my reality. Come on. <laughs> I love when people and do that. I, uh, you know, it's an exciting time to be alive. It's a time where we can question everything. We can question what we're being told. So many people are really looking at the narrative and looking at, okay, the last couple of years, maybe we weren't exactly told what we, uh, we thought was the truth. And yeah. And now we can, when we deconstruct all that, now we can create something new. Now we can create something that we're participating in. And that doesn't really answer the question of who I am. Um, But No, but it's perfect uh, because we talk about the participatory universe, had a psychologist as well, Mel Schwartz on here, uh, wrote a phenomenal book, uh, The Possibility Principle, and we are going to get into Jesus and sex in your book, which is a tongue twister, and I want to talk to you about that as well. Uh, So no, this is it's perfect. You're right at home here. Um, And, you know, you're sexual educator, sexuality educator, rather, but you're also a pioneer in consciousness studies. And this is something I... With, that we weave into everything because it is kind of what we're finding out. I'm sure you and your studies have found this out as well. Is it's kind of the underpinning of everything. What do you? What is your um, information on consciousness studies uh, brought you? Hmm. Big big topic to unpack. Well, the way that I would synthesize that is to say that 
we are here on purpose. We are here to co-create reality that we are God incarnate and we come here forgetting who we are and in, in, in we inhabit bodies and that gives us a sense of an illusion of being separate. But the human journey is about re-remembering that, you know what, we just took on these flesh suits for a period of time, but it was really about, so to speak, bringing heaven to earth for us to participate in bringing a higher consciousness to the planet. And that without each of our contribution, you doing this podcast, is bringing a higher consciousness to the planet, right? So we wake up, a lot of people have woken up last couple of years and realized, I don't want to work in a grocery store anymore. I don't want to like, you know, be a waiter or, you know, not that those are, uh, you know, any job is honorable. And if that's what you're called to do, fantastic. But there's a sense of, you know, when, am I just here to pay bills? Am I just here to like go through the motions? Or is there something bigger for my life? And we're breaking free from this idea that we have to exchange our hourly time for currency. And we're breaking free to a elevated idea that, you know what, there's something inside me that the universe wants to express as me, as this individuation. And if I bring that to the planet and I bring value to the planet, there's going to be prosperity in return for that, right? And so we're breaking free from all of this control mechanism that we have to work for this employer and be a slave and do all of that. And I think this is part and parcel of us claiming our spiritual sovereignty. And yeah, sexuality is part of that. But the bigger whole thing here is I believe we are at the time that's been prophesized for such a long time that there will be this point in humanity where people collectively raise the vibration of the planet and we don't live as slaves to the matrix anymore that we live in the as these beings that can co-create our reality and i believe you choose chose to incarnate now i believe i chose to incarnate now and we all did like we're like hey sign me up i want to be part of like creating something new like you know, and it it sucks sometimes like it is it's scary because anytime you're kind of creating a new path and a new way of doing things and it's never been done before. It's like, holy shit, what am I doing? There's no there's no like playbook for this. We're creating it. We're like the first group of people who are, you know, some would say, OK, we've been evolved in the past, too. Well, maybe so. But at this time we are here to forge this new reality. Hell yeah. It's been super dense and super dense for a while. Like we'd say at least a hundred years, right? A hundred and some change. So we, we know what you mean when you say awakening and this change. And so you're, you're right on brand here. This is perfect. Uh, now, um, to something that you said with the uh, unity part of it, that is absolutely something that we absolutely talk about here. So what made you go that direction like was there was there a book you were handed was there a conversation that you had to kind of uh, that awoke you to this just even idea that there was one thing experiencing itself subjectively one thing experience how did i wake up to that you know <laughs> as i'm sure you can agree when you're in that and you live that it's like okay when did i not live that that's the big question i would say that I knew it viscerally before I knew it intellectually. So I've since been fascinated to learn the science of this. Like, I just like love that. But when I was a little kid and I was going through tumultuous times in my childhood with a lot of chaos in the home and stuff, and I couldn't get a sense of security at home. I couldn't get a sense of certainty at home. There was never a sense that, okay, tomorrow is going to be stable or you're going to like, there was no sense of um, what you would expect to get that sense of security and love and protection. So I could either implode and suicide myself, which was an option at a certain time. I thought about that, or I could find that connection and find that sense of certainty somewhere else. And for me, it was being in nature. For me, it was realizing that 
anytime I was on the brink of really hopelessness and giving up and saying, I want out of here, because there was a part of me that remembered that love is real. There was a part of me that remembered that there is order in the universe. As a little kid, I could go into nature and re-remember that there was something else. And in fact, part of the suicide was, I want back there. <laughs> like, I, I didn't really mean when I said I wanted to show up now. Like, I want back there because this is hell and I want back there. And um, every time I kind of was at that choice point to like make that decision, something would show up in my life that was like, no, you decided you have to be here. You haven't done your mission. And I would stay. So it was kind of this visceral sense inside of me that there was this higher order, that there was something more. I mean, and this continued right through to, you know, one time I almost got lost. I almost died in a forest in when I lived in uh, in in British Columbia. And I decided to go to these hot springs in the middle of winter with a girlfriend. And we went down to the hot springs. There's no one else around because there's lots of snow. And we're in our bathing suits and we're in flip flops. Right. And um, here we are in the hot springs. Ah, oh, this is fantastic. But we arrived there late just as darkness was falling. And I have like zero sense of direction. <laughs> and neither did she. And this was actually before cell phones dating myself. But um, so we were in the hot springs and then we're like, oh, OK, I guess darkness is falling. We should find our way back to like where we wanted to set up our tent. And we thought we were going on the right path and we were in pretty dense forest at this time. And we were like way going the wrong path and make a long story short, we ended up walking for like six hours and there was torrential rain. I only had a very light little, you know, rain jacket to put over my bathing suit. Otherwise I was just flip flops and that's it. And, you know, my bathing suit. And uh, you, there was like, you could hear animals <laughs> around us and stuff. And my friend who didn't have this she grew up in a great home. She grew up with lots of love around her. So she never really sought the divine in the way I did. And she was melting down. She was like, this is this is it. Um, she was having panic attacks, which she never had before. She was melting down. But at this point, I had already gone through a lot of my own like questioning and wondering. And I was convinced I had something to do here. Right. And then, but here I am, it's confusing because it's like, okay, we're clearly screwed because we don't know how to get back to where we're at. And I lost a shoe at one point. We almost fell down this really deep hole in the, in the forest. And she's like panicking and I'm like not crying and I'm not losing it because I'm like, you know what? This is not the point in the story where I die. Like on the play of my life, me being this person on this stage, like this is not the point where I exit. Like, I just know that. I don't know how I'm getting out of here. There isn't like some thing that's showing up, but like, I know this isn't where I'm exiting. And lo and behold, like, in the middle of the night, this dude with his dog leaves Whistler, which was several miles up the road, gets in his car and he has this intuition to go walking in the forest, <laughs> you know? So all of a sudden we see this dude in the thick of the forest walking his dog and we connect with him and he brings us to his truck gives us hot chocolate. He waits until the night is over. He sleeps in his truck. We sleep in our tent and he makes sure that we're OK. And then we part our ways. Right. And it was just like that wasn't lost on me. Like I realized, OK, there is a higher order like there is the guy didn't even know why he was there. Right. And he could have fucking killed us. Like he could have like, oh, I think I'm going to carve these people up and eat them. Like he could have been a weirdo. Right. But he wasn't. And and it just showed me, you know what? There is a divine order to things. And, you know, but everything is perception, too. I will say my friend who didn't have that anchoring in a divinity of being ordered, she saw that rescuing as a close call to 
everything corrupting and imploding. And from that day on, she took medication for panic attacks. So it's what this shows me is that it's not the event, just like Okay, so I have a psychology degree and I've studied trauma and stuff like that, right? It's not that somebody abused you or that you were in a violent situation that fucks you up, right? It's how you frame that to yourself. And I'm not minimizing that bad shit happens to people and fucks them up. I get it. I get it. But it's how you hold that in you, right? What framework you have, right? Like, what is your framework around it? Is the world just a, like, is everything meaningless and it's all just stupid and we're just here and it has no meaning? You know, that's one frame. But because I was in such a chaotic home, I had to reach for a different meaning. And that meaning actually carried me through. So I left that forest with the feeling of, holy shit, there is a higher power. There is some order to the universe. There is divine order. My friend left with, this is all crap. This is a piece of shit. And I'm just like spiraling downward and I, I need to be on pharmaceuticals for the rest of my life. And that's where she, her reality, it's two different. We're in this, we were in the same situation, but two different perceptions and and that's what I, I honor and I recognize you know, none is right, none is wrong. It's just how we perceive it, right? Damn, you're absolutely right. And that is a fascinating story. And really, you can uh, scale this up to uh, it's a great metaphor for what we're all experiencing right now or did about two years ago, whatever, uh, because that was kind of the event, like the events, like what you experienced being lost in the woods at that time. It was the thing that happened in 2020. Right. And so this really shook people that weren't ready for something like this. And so they're just both interesting shakeups, right? In your experience, that's how you took it. The other took it as I barely made it out of this thing. And thank God. Now, thank God pharmaceuticals are here to aid me in my recovery from this event. You transmuted it like the alchemist you are with the understanding you have, which is brilliant, uh, into something positive, something you were in more understanding and comfort about. And really, this is how, again, this split has been received by a lot of folks. Now, it has shaken a lot of people off of medication. And so there's been a side you know, amplification of things as well. But this is a good example it's a great metaphor of what happened to us in 2020 or for us rather is how I'd like to put it uh, for us in 2020 and it really screwed a lot of people up and this is one of the things I was talking about to I forget who it was we were on this kind of conversation and uh, I was saying you know I, I feel kind of you know not bad but I'm definitely empathetic for folks like that who like it's it's challenging for us and we know what's going on you know what I mean and they just have no clue what's going on and just being rocked from all directions and Schumann residence this and all my friends are gone and doing mushrooms that and and they just have no idea what's going on, you know? So it's uh, been challenging, but interesting, but great metaphor and side personal note. I'm grateful you're here with us and that whatever steered you in the direction for our encounter, I'm grateful that it existed and kept you alive at least long enough for us to connect. So thank you for mm. hanging out. Likewise, with us. buddy. Likewise. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So have you ever had any like near death experience or anything like that from any, like, have you ever attempted or gotten close and gotten called back or what were kind of the divine interventions? I used to listen to a lot of Metallica in my okay. bedroom. <laughs> That'll do and it. It's like, fuck that shit is dark, man. That shit is dark. <laughs> yeah. And since then I've learned about sound vibration and how holy shit, you can merge with that sound and you can like, you can be in hell and be on earth by merging with vibration. Right. Um, so to answer your question, no, I have not had a near death experience, but I have had sex and I have merged with a reality that fucking was not here, man. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> so, and I've also done ayahuasca, you know, I, so, but I would say sex is better. So, um, and a lot of the parallels about accessing a higher state through psychedelics and sex completely map together, like what your mindset is before the context is that type of thing. Um, so when I met my partner, I was in a very locked view of what sex was. I thought it was the antithesis of a spiritual experience. I thought those two things were separate. 
I happened to meet someone who, well, first of all, the reason why I was attracted to him was not like, oh my God, he has a hot body. Cause I actually was like, I, I was one of those people that saw what relationships could do and how they could disempower you. And I felt like I'm never going to be sucked into that control mechanism. I'm going to be resilient and on my own. But when I, the universe sometimes does weird things like in the forest, right? Brings people together and you see them and you're like, oh my God, I think I know you, but you don't really know them. And you're like, I think I know you. And there was that recognition um, because I was used to seeing kind of through spiritual eyes when I was a kid, which I had to, to kind of give myself sanity. I could flip into that sense and kind of shut off my conscious mind. And when I first met him, I'm like, okay, I recognize something here. Right. And, and that gave me the sense that I could trust this person. And thankfully this person didn't have the religious frame that I had uh, come into the world with, or had been educated with. And he had an elevated view of, what sex could be, right? And um, actually, I had my own traumatic experiences with sex. He had a woman who had done something really terrible. I don't mean to laugh, but he would laugh about it. But it, you know, there was, he could never have older sex from a woman because he got freaking freaked out by what this you know, when he was a teenager, what someone had done to him. So we both had our hang up sexually when we first met. Right. And even though he had been with a lot of women, there was like some places he wouldn't go. So we both had kind of a sense of discovering, OK, is there something more? And because uh, we actually when we first met, it was a long distance. Um, I was in another country, like Canada and the United States. And um, so there's a lot of chance to kind of have a more of a felt understanding connection about who we both are. And anyway, um, he started to break my paradigm when he said to me, I think Mary Magdalene was the greatest gift to the planet. And I think she held the keys to the planet. And I'm like, what? Wasn't she a prostitute? Like, what? And he's like, no, that was like a lie. And he handed me this book called um, The Woman with the Alabaster Jar by Margaret Starbird. And it was a scholarly, it's a scholarly book. And it, it kind of deconstructed all of that for me. And I Jesus never really meant a lot to me when I was going through Catholic school because I felt like, okay, he's this like dude that's way up there. And, you know, and I, I, I just divorced myself from all of the, um, uh, you got to feel bad and fearful of God. That didn't mean anything to me. When I was in nature, I didn't fear God. I didn't feel bad. I didn't live a life of I'm sinful. I, I felt really connected to a presence, right? But I didn't have like a sense of there being someone in the past that I could like connect with, right? But when I read this book about Mary Magdalene, I'm like, holy shit, like she felt like she was a real person. And it felt like it wasn't that she was this virginal thing. It was like she was a sexual woman and she was equal to Jesus. And that's what I felt, right? And OK, but I'm not in this incarnation. I'm like this kid that's gone through all this shit and, you know, with this real religious programming. So I started to when I was a little kid, I felt like I connect to dead people really easily. When relatives died, I would give messages to my parents like, oh, Uncle Lee wants to say this. And it was always meaningful to them. Like, I just felt like. I felt like I loved the other side more than the people here. The people here are like crazy mean, like, ah. <laughs> but on the other side, they were loving. I could connect with them. So I would always do that. Like that was my go-to, right? And so when I read this book about Mary Magdalene, I started to feel like, I think I could connect with her. And so I started to like meditation and journaling started to like, reach out to her. And it was through that direct connection with her that I allowed 
so there's this book um, called The Interconnected Universe by Irvin Lasko, and he talks about memory being in the field, not being in the brain. And so that really meant something to me. So I said, OK, I don't have a good representation of sexuality from my past. Right. And if I'm just trying to remake myself sexually by this kid that was abused, there's not really very far for me to go. But if I can pick up on Mary Magdalene's sexual energy, like if I if if that energy is in the field and anyone can access it, I'm not going to access my personal history on sex. I'm going to access her history on sex. Oh, yeah. And so when I'm with my husband, I was like, OK, I'm going to bring her energy into my body and I am now accessing from her and rather than go through like 10 years of therapy and try to unravel myself, I didn't do that. Right. I just merged with her being. And when I did that and I'm with him and there is a sense of being able to access a reality beyond this dimension, right. Of being able to go beyond and a feeling of, complete uh, a sense of unconditional love beyond just human love, right? And a sense of complete interconnect, like a feeling of vibrating so much in your whole being that you split apart, like you're no longer here, right? And just like the intense radiation of light, the whole thing. And, um, that has given me the sense that this is why I go back to the Matrix movie too, the Matrix Measure Direction. I really think that's giving us this path that it was always about accessing a state of bliss in a sexual union, in a loving union that brings us to this higher state, you know? So anyway. Yeah. And bonus, it's technically a threesome. So congratulations. Um, so what is how does sexuality cause the imprisonment of humanity? I mean, because this is something that, you know, taboos kind of uh, put restraints on this. And I've had um, man Jenny Rivers on the show. I talk about this every time we talk about taboos because she she's brilliant. Uh, but she talked about taboos being guardians to knowledge. And that's that's where the secrets are. Like, that's where the dope shit is found is right on the other side of you not listening to what you're told. Right. Oh, you're not listening to what you're told. Mm hmm. Yeah, like from the system, like them telling you don't uh, view sex in the way that you that you, Dr. Jenny. Oh, view yeah. It. Yeah. And so the yeah. system tells you, hey, don't do this. And so they put these taboos in place and right on the other side of those taboos, like they're guardians for sacred knowledge. Like once you break free of those, there's some amazing stuff to be found on the other side of that. Yes. Yes. And so let me just say about the threesome. So you, in the Tantra, you have this idea that you become the goddess and your partner becomes the God and it's the two of you. What I see in the lost teachings of Jesus is essentially a trinity, right? Is that it's you represented divine, it's your partner represented divine, but very viscerally, you know that it's not just the two of you in the room anymore. There is the presence of a third. Absolutely, there is a presence of the third. In much the same way when like Rick Straussman was a Buddhist when he did DMT, right? And then he's like, holy shit, it's not a void. It's not like a void like I was taught. It's actually filled with life. It's filled with energy. It's filled with beings. And he had to, to really question that view and it made him go back to like the Hebrew scripture and all of that. Anyway, um, I do believe that what you just said about on the uh, you, you express it very well um, b about on the other side oh, that's, of that's Jenny Rivers thing. She's phenomenal. Oh, I'm just okay. parroting her. But yeah, on the other side of uh, taboos, that's where that beautiful yeah. knowledge is at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And not to get into conspiracy theory or anything, but Bring one it. could say <laughs> Bring it. we talk about one, all of it. Come on. One, one could say that. You know, they all, it, it was known all along that it was sexual connection that brought us there and that how do you suppress and control humanity by suppressing that energy? And in it, patriarchal, you know, 
controlled uh, dominating societies do have this kind of um, juxtaposition with sex. On the one hand, it's everywhere and porn, which is a very kind of a domination type of view of sex. On the other hand, it's like you're not supposed to talk about it. And if you're, you're supposed to be like not even wanting it. And, you know, it's like this juxtaposition. Right. But you control a population by suppressing the sexual energy, not allowing a real sacred, um, you know, immersion of that energy. Right. But in the Matrix movies, and at one, it talks about the Merovingians having a key to the Matrix. So what Margaret Starber talks about in her book, The Woman with the Alabaster Jar, is the Merovingians were the royal bloodline in France. They were kings in France. They held the royal bloodline of Mary and Mary and uh, Jesus and Mary Magdalene, which the Matrix movie are kind of bringing back that whole thing which links to the Knights Templars, which links to the Freemasons and all of that. And it's got corrupted, like it's got corrupted. It's become a very dark act, right? Where you do sacred sexual rituals to kill people and destroy them to take their energy, to take the DMT, adronochrome and all of that to, but they use sex. Why is sex used in those very dark rituals? Because there is, the veil is thin in that act, right? And you can do it and, and create terror in the other person and basically destruct the other person. And you can access DMT. But as we know, with psychedelics, with all of this, you can have a bad trip and get some really dark entities that you're connecting with, right? Or you can have a good trip and have light and love and all of that, right? So if you're going into it with the intention of I'm going to take from you, I'm going to control you and take your energy from you, because that comes from a state of lack, scarcity. You know, I don't have the energy, so I have to take from you. And if you do that, you're going to be accessing the the veil, you're going to go through, break through the veil, but you're doing it at a very low, low vibration, right? The other side of it is to what Neo and Trinity exemplify is complete open heartedness, complete respect, complete love, complete devotion. They would die for each other. They would, you know, they care for the other person almost, as, you know, more than themselves. Like there's this complete devotion and union and that, that unites the world that elevates the consciousness of everyone. It's not based on scarcity. It's based on unity. It's based on all of that. But what it shows in the movies is the Merovingians have the key. Why do they have the key to the matrix? Because the key was always this sacred sexual connection between Jesus and Mary Magdalene, that being suppressed and inverted, vilifying the, the feminine as just a whore, right? That she was just um, a paid prostitute, right? Elevating this celibate version of the male, elevating a celibate version of the Virgin Mary. And so we've lost the access to the potency of the sexual energy. It's been, it's been taken in the celibacy of Jesus and it's been distorted in a control mechanism in the prostitute, right? But when we, the secrets that the Merovingians held and the Knights Templar and the Masons held was that this alchemy when you really do access the sexual energy, there's an alchemy. This is the philosopher's stone. This is all of this, right? You access the, you, you break the veil. Like you act, you access the divine, you access the higher realm. And if we can distort sexuality in a culture and make people believe it's just about fucking and it's about, power dynamics and pain and suffering, then they're never going to access the heightened state. And you know what? If they never access the heightened state, they're totally controllable. As the final scene in The Matrix Resurrection talks about, 
The sheeple don't want to be free. The sheeple want to be controlled. They want certainty. Well, if you're not able to access your true higher consciousness, what do you crave? You crave for someone to tell you what to do. Oh, I really want certainty because I have no certainty inside me. Oh, I really want control because I have none. But when you're able to access that directly, you're like, fuck you. I don't want to be told what to do. Like, I can access that myself, right? But the hierarchy of the church, the hierarchy of the elite institutions in our world, they want to distort that energy so that we don't access it. So we don't know that that really was the source. That really was it. And if we don't know, and if we're unaware, well, then we walk around being disconnected from it. Could not agree more. It's a phenomenal way that you put it. And yes, uh, the Matrix movies do portray, I never even thought of it as a Jesus Mary Magdalene thing, a connection. I knew the Jesus allegory was in there, but that's a brilliant way that you put it. So uh, what about the folks that like astro theologists who don't think that Jesus was necessarily a real person and that the Savior and all of the things of the Bible are really more an- analogous, like they're they're not real. Um, even, even then this, though, it could have been a story uh, that was reappropriated to just like you said. Uh, celibatize Jesus and prosthesize Mary. And so it, it's this inversion of reality that we talk about quite a bit on here. And so, of course, it would have been uh, apprehended and adapted to their needs, which is to do the opposite of what's actually true and freeing for you. Could not agree more, darling. Uh, excellent, excellent call. So why then do you think that it is so suppressed? Uh, we know why at a high level, but from your, in your opinion, do you think that there's this just control system like a matrix here? And if so, like, what's it for? Well, is there control? So I think everybody would agree last couple of years, like totally right. It's just coming out like, fuck, I got to wear a fucking mask. Like, <laughs> holy fucking shit. Like Philadelphia or something is going back to masks. Like really? I thought we were done with this. Aren't they done? Yeah, I just, I, I thought I heard it I, that just recently. Um, but like, here's the deal. Like they're going to come up with, it's always going to be some next thing, right? Until we break free. Uh, so your question was, do I think there's a matrix? Was that the question? What was the question? Yeah, just like a control system in place. And what role do you think that their suppression of sex plays in that control system? Well, if you see it the way that I'm, I see it, that the breaking free from the whole control mechanism is through re-envisioning sex, not in the way that it's held today. So it's, if you, gosh, the way that sex is talked about, even in when they're trying to do it in schools today, it's talked about in and not in the way that I'm talking about it. I'm talking about it in a way that if you looked at the accessing a psychedelic state of consciousness, it is about being with the partner from a state of conscious intention that you're going to access a higher state. Let me just back up a second. In Michael Pollan's book um, about his big thick book about um, plants and plant medicines and stuff where he had shared his own journey. In one part of that, he talked about how we've lost connection with indigenous cultures and that we just use these things recreationally and we don't even realize how powerful they are and what they represent. They really represent being able to access expanded states of consciousness, expanded reality. Come on. And <laughs> and without the framework from indigenous cultures, we're kind of like all over the place. And some, you know, people can have like really terrifying experiences and kind of go off the deep end, right? Well, I believe that absolutely parallels the subject of sex because I believe our creator, however you envision that, has given us plants 
and has given our human body both with a very powerful psychedelic substance, not on accident, but with the intention that we were supposed to discover how friggin' powerful we are. And we were supposed to not walk around as little robots being told what to do. We were supposed to walk around as friggin' gods. We were supposed to walk around as enlightened beings and friggin' co-create this planet, not leaving just a few billionaires to create it and tell us what to do, but we were supposed to claim our divine sovereignty. And without, because religion has broken apart this idea that sex and spirituality to get are together, we don't have a framework, not that we need a, a rule book, like you shouldn't do this. And you, we don't need a rule book, just like you don't need a rule book for psychedelics, but you need a framework because without a sense of what's possible, you don't know that you can go there. So your body is equipped to access states of higher states of consciousness through sexual union. Every person's body is is wired for that but until someone says okay this is how your body works this is what's possible and this is the the mindset you need this is the setting that you need like these are the kind of the prerequisites that help induce these possibilities you don't know you just see porn and you see you know all these control mechanisms and you think okay i'm supposed to like tie up my partner. I'm supposed to like do all these things. And that, not to judge any of that, but <laughs> what bothers me is when sometimes when people, women come to work with me in my courses, they think, oh, doing BDSM, like that's like the forbidden cool stuff, right? The like um, sappy lovemaking, that's like too religious. And I get what they're saying. Like you want to break out of being, you know, stuck in some kind of um, boring way of expressing yourself, but they don't know that it's actually the church that propagated that idea of pain and suffering during sex. They actually um, put that forth and all of the BDSM that we see on porn today is actually totally in line with what the church wanted. So at a certain point in church history, women who were like married to Jesus carved into their body, like different things to show their devotion to Jesus, like the mortification of the flesh, which shows up in bondage, discipline, sadomasochism was absolutely, you could be canonized in the church. If you whipped yourself, if you carved yourself, you could have automatic sainthood if you uh, um you know basically created intense pain and torture of your body which is in essence um bdsm and the what the what these actually it was men and women who did this in the church at some point in history they called it ecstasy they were the pain was ecstasy so when People come into my classes today and say, oh, I'm liberated because I'm doing the forbidden. I'm like doing this dark stuff. I'm like, don't you realize that that forbidden is exactly what they want you to do? Because as soon as you from a brain science perspective, as soon as you access a state of pain and suffering, right? you're going to have the op opioid response kick in, which gives you a disassociated state, which is not the expanded state, the DMT state, that's going to access the uh, higher dimensions. What that's going to do is, in essence, you might as well get into a car accident and go to the hospital in that kind of zoned out state. It's what your body does to protect you so you don't go into complete shock, right? But by willingly consenting to that kind of torture, and we call it erotic, we're seen as like liberated and cool, but, and, you know, oh, well, I consented to it. It's, you know, great. Well, fine, go ahead and consent to whatever you want, but you're part of the matrix when you engage in pain and suffering. You're stuck in the matrix. You're not getting out of the matrix. And I believe that was part of the control mechanism to have porn today kind of propagate what the church wanted, which was to keep us believing that pain suffering is the way to liberation and it's not when you look at the the physics of how we 
the biophotons in our body, how the torsion feels, uh, you know, with the quantum entanglement. When you look at all of this, you must be in a state of bliss without suffering to access that. You must be in a state of bliss. So our society is so focused on suffering, so focused on martyring yourself. Born again Christians say, I'm saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. It was his suffering that liberated me. I don't believe Jesus Christ elevated suffering at all. When I read, which is the book that I have forthcoming, when I read the Gospel of Philip, I don't see at all an elevation of suffering as the path. What I see is an elevation of getting into your body, not denying the body like in a lot of traditions. A lot of traditions is you got to sit, you got to discipline your body, you got to like overcome the body. The body is animalistic. The body desires are animalistic. You got to overcome the body, be really strict about this, and then you get liberated. Well, that's not what I see in the Gospel of Philip. The Gospel of Philip is get into your sensuality, get into like being fully in pleasure, fully in sexual pleasure. And when you're fully embodied, that's when the default mode network shuts down. That's when you're able to access, you know, as Aldous Huxley talked about in the doors of perception, our brain is a filter right? Our brain is a filter. There's way more out there than we can ever perceive at any given moment. Dogs can hear sounds that we can't hear. Birds can see um, in the spectrum of light that we can't see. So there's way more out there than we can perceive. We would go crazy. I mean, people have schizophrenia that do perceive too much, right? We would go crazy if we perceived more. But for those moments when we're when we're prepared, like this is why we need a framework. When we're prepared, otherwise we can go psychotic. When we're prepared, we can access these states of unitive consciousness, not to live there all the time. If we live there all the time, then we lose touch with our contribution of the planet. We need to access these states of bliss consciousness, bring that into our body, and then to be able to go about in the world. And whatever our calling is, if your calling is to interview people and bring new ideas to the world and have great conversations, that's your contribution. And people have a high for doing like you, you, you get something from making your contribution to the planet. We're here to make that contribution. Right. And it's it's to be able to access that state of bliss and then bring that into whatever you're doing so that you fulfill your part of the puzzle. And if we all fulfill our parts of the puzzle, the whole planet lifts up. Now, let me ask you this, because I'm curious about it philosophically, your, your take on this. Now, um, we would all like things to be different here. We we like think uh, like child's cancer sucks. We, we hate the, the things that we go through and experience that make us who we are. But that's the flip side of that, right? The, the fact of who we are and that we can observe that there are things around us that we would like to change, we're only afforded the clarity of by having experienced that. So in my mind, uh, and I've talked about this just briefly, but uh, it, it seems like really there's nothing here to fix. And I know that that kind of sucks. And I've said this before, but uh, it seems that the way in which we learn in this place, because that's kind of how I tend to view this just and idealistically, would be that it's supposed to be this shitty. You know, it's supposed to be this hard. Uh, you're supposed to figure it out and then make it better and then create something better later. But here, what we're experiencing, the matrix, is necessary for that development. So the question is, is uh, do you think that's accurate? And if not, how would the next generation of people who have never experienced stuff like this gain the understanding of it, having not experienced it themselves? Yeah, that's like a very powerful question. It's a very powerful thought, right? You know, and... I don't have the answer to that. And I mean, we can all think about that, right? But someone said to me that, I heard so someone said to me, we're talking about trauma, right? And they said, well, trauma has to happen. And I go, why? Well, trauma is the way that you learn. And I get that. But first of all, I don't wish, you know, intense trauma and in anyone, but that's a story that we have been told that we have to go through like terrible things 
to evolve. Is that the only way to evolve or is that something that we've all bought into? Right. You know, um, I do believe like has been prophesized that we're on the verge of going through an, a, a, a change in our planet. And I don't know, like the show by Greg Braden on Gaia that was on for a while. And he talked about in some of his shows that there was a time where we were more evolved on the planet. And that kind of makes sense because things like the pyramids and different things, they don't make sense from our logical mind. Were these people accessing and, you know, of course, ancient aliens and all of that, I get it. But the time that they built the pyramids, they also worshiped Isis and Isis had, yes, there were plant medicines, but there was also the idea of rebirth through heroes gamas through sexual union right there was also this idea that they would have these sacred sexual rituals where they would evoke a higher presence where it brought fertility to the land where it brought you know the crops were better and all of this it but it also bestowed power earthly power on the king right that he was able to access an unseen power for his to be to lead by having sex with the person that was representing the divine feminine but can we can we right now life is about struggle right you work hard and you try to pay your taxes if you still believe in that but you work hard like life is hard and then you die right you 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 live your life to pay bills and then you die right i in if you look at those videos of those if like his show for instance you get this sense that people didn't live like that in the past like they lived with the sense that i'm here to evolve myself like i'm here to make a contribution they didn't live with this sense of slavery but through our ego ruling the world and you could say patriarchy right kind of people's egos running out of control with this sense of kind of competing with the divinity, right? They're gonna put Neuralink in our brain because they think that they can do better than our divine design, right? They're going to um, merge us with machines because they can do better than the creation that is us, right? So there's this e ego that is running the earth right now, but it's also running us into the ground. And before that can happen, there's this opportunity for us to claim our spiritual sovereignty. I do believe that, you know, we haven't seen that in any recent time where we lived in an elevated state, but that is the divine design for humanity. I believe that is why we're here. And in the book, The Gospel of Philip, it talks about we are here to resurrect. And what does resurrect mean? It's not that you die and then you come back to life. It's that you kind of like what we talk about in psychedelics, you have an ego dissolution, right? Ego death. You access that state that's beyond the personal self. And when you access that state that's beyond the personal self, you live as a, quote, enlightened being, you know, not that you stop doing daily activities like, you know, work in the world and stuff like that, but you do it from a different state of consciousness. And I, I think we're at this time because listen, we are either going to surrender to elite forces that really want this new world order and just like, okay, do it. Okay. We'll be your little gopher slaver slave for that. Or we're going to say, no, we claim our divine sovereignty. We are not going to participate in your reality and we're going, we're creating something new. And I think we are at this huge, this incredible choice point. We are here to make the difference. This idea that someone is going to save us is what a lot of people believe, still believe, regardless of whether they're religious or not, right? And 
that is the antithesis of what the Matrix movie is talking about, what the Gospel of Philip's talking about. It's talking about we have to resurrect within. And when we realize our own power, then we walk as a different type of human on the planet. And listen, I love psychedelics, but why I think it's missing the boat as the evolution for humanity is that we weren't meant to be alone. And we weren't meant to just have, oh, I got my own enlightenment, like, fuck you. I got my own. It wasn't meant to be about that. It was the reason why I like the Matrix story and the Matrix resurrection is I believe that showing that if we absolutely love someone almost more than ourselves and we devote ourselves to that relationship, not out of codependency, but out of I know who I am. I have a direct relationship with my own higher self. You know who you are. But when we come together, and we know this even through science, through the physics of two electromagnetic fields coming together, emerging, and what happens in terms of the energy that's generated when two beings who have their heart open, who have sex, actually are joined in that union, there is what it shows in the Matrix movie when neo touches trinity at a certain point there's an explosion of light that's science that science right so there is no darkness that can suppress humanity when we have a sense of open-heartedness and realize we can access this higher state through loving connection and and listen i'm all about freedom of choice but there is something very special between a man and a woman there's something very special, right? And it and it's not just the Jungian thing of accessing your internal masculine feminine. Fine, got it, perfect. But there's something very special about a man accessing his masculinity, a woman accessing her femininity, and then having a open-hearted connection and actually a physical connection. There is something scientifically, spiritually out of this world, powerful, that it would change the planet if we realize the power of that. It's a deep rabbit hole. And I absolutely love uh, the way that you communicate about this topic, because this is a tricky one. And this is an interesting one, but it's very, very important. Uh, The way that you describe, uh, I love your psychedelic uh, cervix thing, by the way, Uh, say the full title of that for the audience. Oh, so the psychedelic cervix is a course that I teach. Yeah. It's so cool. Okay. And uh, of course, all the ways guys to find her are going to be linked down in the show notes. So just, I, I want to close with your final thoughts on just what we can do to move forward. Is this an individual thing that we have to individually embark on? Or is this a co-collective creation? Or is there some, a bit of both? Well, I think it's individual and collective. And I think that we... Religion has suppressed our true awakening to a certain extent, but we also, as Michael Pollan said in his book, we need we need guidelines. We need a framework. We need to be able to view the secret codes to this waking up. I believe the Gospel of Philip contains those secret codes. It contains what was suppressed from the Merovingians. And this is what I'm bringing out in the secret say the the book that you'll link down below right i'm bringing that out in that book to really show people that there was a hidden suppressed message that jesus showed up on the planet not to give us a bunch of rules about what we shouldn't do and not to even put himself as the guy right but to give an example and even if he didn't live fine cool whatever right but you can use this as a story as a metaphor And when you realize his co-equal of Mary Magdalene, you can use that story as a metaphor of waking up. And it's actually, it parallels the Trinity and Neo story. That when we realize that we don't do this on our own, we do this through loving, open-hearted connection. And the when we're, our heart brain is in um, coherence, right? The work of heart math, but then we have social coherence through the connection with another person. This creates global coherence for the planet, but it all starts with 
us realizing the divine is within us, but then not, not just saying, oh, it's about my bliss. It's about how much more bliss can I have for myself? The way it works is that if you try to just do it for yourself, it dissipates. But if you've seen um, the, the rebound effect that Lynn McTaggart talks about, when you actually send that vibration out to another person, it magnifies it back to yourself. So the way to even go higher than what you have before is to share that vibration with another person. And when you do it, not just oh, I'm going to sit and sit across from someone and meditate and send that. That's fine. But what we know is when you do it with a, with a physical sexual union, there are specific ways your brain is hardwired through the rhythmic movement of intercourse through the touch, physical touch, all of that activates, it trips circuits in your brain to shut down the task-oriented brain, to access a higher state of consciousness, to open the pineal gland, to trigger the release of dimethyltryptamine, all of that, which brings us into the most evolved state. That's what I believe. Dr. Jenny Martin, thank you so much. Of course, Jesus' secret saying about sacred sexuality is going to be located down in the show notes as well as all of the ways to find you. You're fascinating. We have so much more to talk about, so I will definitely be inviting you back on. So thank you so much for your time again. I really appreciate it. This is so oh, cool. Oh, thank you so much. I loved it. It's so cool what you're doing here. Thank you. What an incredible, incredible woman. Dr. Jenny Martin and all the ways to find her are located down in the show notes. Make sure that you guys check out her book, Jesus's Secret Saying About Sacred Sexuality, as well as her podcast, Why Didn't I Know Podcast. And it's all super awesome, all located down in the show notes. Cannot thank her enough for coming by, and uh, we will definitely invite her back. So, uh, guys, uh, down there located in the show notes as well is our resource links, Food Forest Abundance. Get that freedom from fear on Libsyn if you'd like to start your own podcast. And as well, if you are going to feed the beast that is Amazon, run it through our link. It helps the show. Also down there is Opus. Opus is the Organization for Paranormal Understanding and Support, a phenomenal resource for anybody looking to reach out and connect in that way. Also located down there, guys, is going to be expandingrealitypodcast.com. That is going to be links to all the socials. Lives are replayed there. You can jump on the store and check out the merch, uh, as well as the collaborations, other shows that I've been uh, grateful to be a part of. All that stuff is linked and up there. Uh, damn near all of it for free. If you want to go check that out, linked down in the show notes. If you would like to support the show, you can do that at the expansive insider section on that. There's a bunch of bonus stuff and just a really cool way to help the show. And I'm truly grateful for everybody that signed up and is enjoying that. So guys, go out into this incredibly beautiful place, whatever the hell it is, and y'all just pick up a piece of litter. Go ahead and uh, be nice to everybody that you come across, no matter what their state is. It's just a mirror to you, right? So let's have a little extra patience with the other expressions of us that we come across, you know, just kind of throwing that out there. Uh, as well as um, y'all get the hell out of the left-hand lane, you know, uh, it's a pain in the ass. So if you got somebody wanting to pass, just move on over. We'll be right by and you can hop back over there and do whatever the hell you were doing. Uh, go ahead and also, you know, entertain the idea of just picking up somebody's grocery bill every now and then or buying them a coffee or a meal, something like that. Guys, it, that energetic ripple is so powerful and it's incredible. Yeah, I, I just highly recommend it because it's just one of the coolest ways to really change somebody's day that you, you know, air quotes, don't know, right? But man, think of the impact that makes. It's, it's just amazing and so highly recommend. It's such a small thing, but damn it, it goes so far. I, okay, and other than that, guys, go, you know what I'm going to say? Say it every time because I mean it every damn time. Go out into this beautiful ass place, whatever the hell it is, and y'all just be good to one another. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time.